my uncle Bill Klutzbeaker was four-time world walleye fishing champion on the PWT up north. Wow. So when I first started to, you know, I started to point my nose in that direction, I called him. <clears throat> and I'm like, hey, what's the what's the deal? And uh, he said, I'll give, I'll give you two pieces of advice, buddy. Two things you gotta you gotta know. And I'm like, okay. And he said, one, whatever your game plan is, stick to it. Don't vary. If you say we're leaving here at two o'clock because I need to be there at two ten, if you catch a fish at five minutes to two, don't change your plan. There's a reason you wanted to be there at two ten. Go, stay with your plan. You pre-fished it. You know what you want to do. Follow your plan. The other thing he said was, good luck finding a good part, because that's the key. And when you said Andrew Bostic, you know, was the first thing I thought of? Hmm. Seppi. When Bostic and Seppi were together, that's when it gets really scary, because you had you had guys that had really strong skill sets in a couple of different types of red fishing. And then if they had the right partner that had the other skill sets yeah. that were good, boy, it changed. I mean, that that put those teams way ahead, way ahead, because they had that extra book of knowledge on the boat already. This is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Fascinating stories to amaze, encourage, and inspire you in fishing, fitness, and the outdoors. And we're brought to you by Black Rifle Coffee. I started this podcast as a way to connect with my friends, people that I admire and respect, and you. It has been a learning journey that's made me a better person, a better fisherman, a better father, and a better athlete. I'm so happy that you're on this journey with me, and I'd love to hear from you with show suggestions, guest suggestions, or questions. The best way to get a hold of me is through text. You can text 305-930-7346 for the fastest response, but if you prefer to email, you can send that to podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's a dedicated email address just for the show. If you like this show, you can show your support by posting about it on social media and tagging me. Text the link to a couple of friends that may also enjoy it and subscribe and leave a five-star review if you feel like I've earned it. The website is tomrollandpodcast.com and that is where everything lives. All past shows, you can go and listen to any show. You can look up all the different shows that we've done, both the How To Tuesdays, the Full Links, and the Physical Fridays. They all live on tomrollandpodcast.com and the social media is tom underscore Roland R-O-W-L-A-N-D, on Instagram or you can go to our big account, saltwater underscore experience. I hope to hear from you soon. So now let's get on to today's show. Captain Mike Anderson here, Real Animals TV and Radio, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Mike, how you doing? I'm good, Tom. How are you, bud? I'm doing great. What have you been up to? You know, it's uh it's tarpon season for us. So um we've been tarpon fishing and grinding here I, I just finished up my last trip before i start vacation so i'm uh, i'm ready for a breather yeah how was it for you this year uh you know what it was okay um when i talk about tarpon for me you know i cut my teeth in boca grand i spent 10 years guiding in boca grand pass and when you when you go from boca grand pass to tampa bay the water, the, the the amount of water, the amount of area that you find tarpon in changes so much. In Boca Grande, those fish are pretty concentrated. They're in one of three places. They're either on the hill, they're in the ditch, or they're on the beach. It's real simple. In Tampa Bay, is such a big, expansive body of water. They could be in 30 different places. Mm -hmm. And because they have tails and we have tides, they move a lot. And that, it makes it... It's much more difficult here. I think we actually have more fish in Tampa. If you took them all and shoved them into Boca Grande Pass, mm. I think we'd have more fish, but they get spread out. Yeah. There's just a lot more room for them to play here. So it's a little, it's a different fishery. Uh, it's a great fishery. Um, we're extremely crowded here. So that makes it a challenge. Um, you know, you being a, a legendary keys guide, you know the importance of fishing etiquette. 
and it, it gets a little challenging here in Tampa, but, uh, you know, we're making it work. We're getting through it. Yeah. Which, which do you like better? I mean, you compared Boca Grande to, to Tampa. Do you have, I mean, when you look back at the 10 years you spent there and what you're doing now, which, what, what do you like better? There's no, it's, it's not even a contest. Boca Grande is a special, special place. Um, it's, it's my favorite fishery on the planet. Uh, and I miss it, but my world just got crazy busy. You know, two radio shows, the TV show. Uh, my my youngest daughter was was playing AAU basketball. Um, I ended up coaching, and it was just hard to be gone for two straight months, you know, grinding 14, 16 hours a day. It just got to be too much. So something had to give, and, you know, that's what I gave up. I just I came home, and so I stay home. I still fish hard, but I'm at home, mm-hmm. and it makes it easier. So, But there's no – There's very few things, and I don't know if you've ever got to enjoy Boca Grande Pass when it's really right and it's firing off. It's it's incredible. What what an incredible place. Yeah. So the answer is that you like Boca Grande better. Yeah, much better. I just want to make sure I'm clear (laughs) because uh, you know I haven't ever fished there uh, for tarpon, but we did have a redfish tournament up that way out of uh, Burnt Store Marina, I think, and we ended up going by there, and it was tarpon season. And I said, man, we got to just go take a look at this thing, man, because I've heard about it and I want to I want to see it. And, you know, yeah. we have a couple of magnet spots in the Keys. Long Key Bridge is one. Key West Harbor is another where for whatever reason, it's a magnet that the fish want to go there and you can go to other bridges and there are lots of fish there, but not as many as Long Key. And then you go to to, you know, other places that are kind of resemble the harbor, but they're there. I mean, and they're there in big numbers and they come there every year. And Boca Grande is, is the king of that, right? Like it's the, the magnet of all magnets that we have, I guess, in, in, in the United States, maybe there's some places that I don't know about, you know, or haven't fished yet, but um, that, that are like that, but that place, what do you think it is about Boca Grande pass particularly that, that just makes those fish concentrate like that? Well, I think it's the, it's the, you know, it, it's, it's the ambiance. I think it's the closeness. I mean, everything about Boca Grande Pass, the way the water throat flows through that real tight corridor. I mean, it's not a very big pass. It's not tiny, um, but it's not a huge pass either. And, and I, and I also believe that it's the estuary up inside Charlotte Harbor with all the grass with all of the mangrove shoreline back there towards Bull and Turtle Bay and um, up towards all the rivers that dump out there. And it creates that epic, I mean, the crab flush there, when the Mm -hmm. crabs are flowing good, when you have good rain, those crabs pour out of that pass. I mean, it's unbelievable to drift through that pass and just see those incredible fish just slurping crabs off the surface. It's I mean, it's it's a magical place. And, and the other thing I think, too, for, for me, it, it was probably the one thing that helped me out the most in my career as a guide. You know, I, I'm, I'm not from here. So, you know, being born and raised in Wisconsin and, and coming down here and trying to fit into this guide world, you know, with all the good old boys, uh, the big old cheese head trying to slide his way in. Um, you know, Boca Grand, being a Boca Grand guide kind of helped give me a little stamp. I mean, uh, and I, I probably, it's probably very similar, or at least in my, in my brain, you know, when I think of great keys guides, I think of the group like yourself that, that is so great on fly down there. The fly fishing is so epic for our little part of the West coast of Florida, you know, being a, a full-time guide in Boca Grand Pass running trips every day, it gave you a little credentials, you know, gave you a little street cred. So, um, God, it's a special place. If you, you need to come fishing with me one day, I'd love to, I'd oh, love man. to take you there. Oh, I'd love to. I, I really would. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, it's like, you know, on the one hand, you kind of look at some look at some of the pictures and some of the video that I've seen there, and you're like, "Whoa, I've never fished that close to a boat 
ever. <laughs> like, I don't know right. if I want any, any part of that. But on the other side, just as a fan of tarpon and tarpon fishing, and it's like, that is a world-class epic location. And yeah. for me, I would just, you know, it, it, it would be a little uncomfortable to be fishing as close to the boats as I see people fishing up there. Just, I would say uncomfortable. It would be uncomfortable if I was trying to do it myself and I don't know the etiquette and I don't know what's right and what's wrong. And I'm afraid that I'm messing somebody up when you could be totally, that's just the way it goes up there. But to go with somebody that knows how to, you know, stay out of everyone's way and knows what people are expecting. That's a whole different deal. I'd love that. I, w I would like that. I don't think I want to go tackle it on my own. Um, it's really, it's really changed. It's changed a bunch from when I did. It. Yeah. I was, I was a jig. I mean, I was a jig fisherman. Well, I was going to ask you about this because I want to, I want to go over it, but go ahead and explain the differences and what the way different people fish there. Well, I mean, there's, there's a, a great group. Um, and, and I'm not one that bites into the, to the head butting a whole bunch that's go that's gone on down there. Um, you know, there's a great group of, of guides who live bait fish Boca Grand Pass at night. Mm. Um, and, and they, they, they jump just hundreds of fish a season. It's incredible. Uh, and then the jig fishing thing came about and I'm not sure how that started. By the time I got into it, it was just the thing to do. A lot of the Tampa guys were going down there to jig fish Boca Grand Pass. Um, I spent a whole year, my first season down there, never really sticking my nose into the middle of the chaos that was jig fishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're almost rod tip to rod tip, you know, jumping 150 pound tarpon. I mean, it's a little insane. The, the fishery was so good that even sitting on the outside of the, the hustle and bustle, you could still jump six or seven fish a morning, you know, just and just trying to learn it, stay out of everybody's way and just figure it out and watch and and see how, you know, the the, the best of the best were attacking that fishery. Um, and there's a lot that went into it. You know, your lines had to stay straight up and down. There were certain colored jigs that worked depending on the clarity of the water. Sometimes you went with a six ounce jig if you were closer to the moons, because you, again, that line's got to stay straight up and down. You're fishing with mono. You weren't fishing with braid. There was a lot of little, there was a lot of little nuances to it. The other thing, and I think that's, that's really, it's really changed is back in the day, you couldn't, you could hardly drop it. You couldn't drop a jig 10 times and not a, at one point, stick it in a hole in the bottom of Boca Grand Pass and lose your jig. It, it was just a rocky, ledgy mess. And, and I think besides the fact that the live baiters and the jig fishermen finally had enough of one another and went to battle and it got all grumpy and went all the way up, you know, to the FWC and changed in the way we could jig fish that pass and all kinds of nonsense. The big change, I think, came from the beach restoration project that they did on Boca Grande. Hmm. They did a large beach reclamation deal where they piled all this sand back onto Boca Grande, the island itself. And, you know, you could, a, file, a year after that, you could, you could possibly jig fish all day and never lose a jig. Really? Because all that sand that they put on the beach dumped right into Boca Grande Pass and filled most of those holes. And I think that's a big reason that it changed a lot. I also think the sharks, I think the sharks are worse, you know, as we did more and more, um, you know, closures on shark fishing and, and better regulations on our long liners and all that, you know, to protect the sharks, that population grew. Well, that population really likes to eat tarpon. Yeah. So they show up in Boca Grand Pass in big numbers. But when I first started fishing down there, you would have a week, week and a half, right at the beginning of the season where the sharks were pretty bad. And then they'd go away. Mm -hmm. It'll be like they got a full belly and they were done, which is, you know, um, because for me, and I'm sure it would be the same for you, there's nothing worse as a tarpon fisherman than losing a tarpon to a right. shark. Yeah. That's that's the worst. I had days where I just told my people we're, we're done. I'm not going to do this because yeah. we can't, 
We can't catch one. Yeah, you're just feeding. You're just feeding yeah. them. Now, the sharks that you're dealing with there, uh, the sharks that we deal with primarily are hammerheads, but other places have uh, large populations of bull sharks that are that are eating the eating the tarpon too, which I think could possibly be even worse. We've had situations uh, in the Keys, or I've encountered situations where the bull sharks are bad, but primarily it's the hammerheads uh, for us. Long Key Bridge, uh, Bahia Honda. Um, right. Well, uh, that's another magnet spot I forgot to mention. Bahia Honda. That's another one. But uh, primarily, it's the in in my experience, anyway, somebody out there might be man. I get bull shark eat my shark eat my tarpon all the time, but primarily it's hammerheads. Is it primarily hammerheads? I know I've seen a lot of bull shark attacks on video and stuff up there, but what what do you think the split is? Is it is it fifty fifty or? No, it's. I think we have a bigger bull shark problem than we have a hammerhead problem. Although we do have a we do have a hammerhead problem as well. I mean, we lose a fair amount of fish to hammerheads, but the bull shark when the bull sharks get in that ditch, Tom, it's. I mean, it's unbelievable. You'll, you know, and you, you almost get, you get to the point where you're, you know, you're coaching your people like, Hey, if I tell you to open that bail, you open that bail. Cause I need that fish to run off, you know, and I need everybody to hang on. Cause I'm going to try and buzz over there with the boat and kind of run these sharks off. And, and it would get to the point where it was a, where they were in a, a pack of six, seven, eight bull yes. sharks. And it, you just, there's no winning here. We're going to lose and I'm not going to hook another one. So that got a little frustrating, but you know, I mean, there's the beaches, there's ways when that is going on in the past to kind of get away from some of that. Um, But it's, it's a magical place. My wife has even said to me a couple of times that she's felt bad, like, cause I've mentioned in interviews and things that that's my, I mean, that's my, even when I film down there now, if I go by Boca Grand Pass, I always have to just stop and take it in for a minute because it's it's going to be a special place in my soul forever. When, sure. when you, um, it's interesting uh, to 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 discuss this too because you made a you made a, a career decision, right? Like based upon your your family for the most part. Yeah. Like what went yeah. into that decision for you? Um, you know, I mean, obviously Boca Grand is very important, but your family is very important too. How do you how do you kind of come to come to terms with that and and make that decision well i mean it just there there was the two factors i mean you love it it's what you do it's kind of who you are it's who you become um your family to me there's nothing more important than my family the other wild card was well two things really financially if you're if you're renting a condo you're renting a boat slip, you're creating a whole nother house down there for two months. Mm -hmm. There's a great deal of expense. If your wife and your daughters come down on the weekend, you're creating more expense. Mm -hmm. By the time you start to do the math, I'm like, I could probably stay home and make just about the same money because I don't have all this crazy expense. Um, And then the, the, unfortunate battle that was going on between the live baiters and the jig fishermen just kind of got, you know, at some point something bad is going to happen and you're going to be in the middle of something you don't want to be in the middle of or that maybe you do want to be in the middle of, but you know, that's not good for your career. Hmm. So you just, you know, I, I got to the point where, you know, some of the live baiters were taking some shots and I'm snapping at them and you're, you're, that's not what Boca Grand Pass is to me. It's not, you know, and the bad part is it was a turf war. They were accusing us of snagging fish, which I can 110% assure you was not the case. It's not what you're doing down there. There's been many, many days that you would drift. Tom, we would drift for six, seven, eight minutes through a 30 foot stack of tarp. Six, seven, eight boats, ten boats all sitting around. No bites. Mm. That tide would switch. You drift that same group, and the minute that tide had switched, it was game on. You, you, it, you know, and, and anyhow, that that always it, it was a turf war. Yeah, and, and that turf war really came from the PTTS, mm. the Pro Tarpon Tournament Series. Kind of took that thing over the edge, I think, for the, for the locals down there. I mean, we just, I mean, 
and I was in it. I mean, we, I fished it every weekend. It, 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 we took that place over. Yeah. Um, and I had even mentioned to the powers that be in the PTTS that, you know, there's a way to do this. I think where you guys could still make the same amount of money, but we don't need to take over the pass. We need to have 65 boats fishing a tournament there on Saturday and Sunday. Mm. That's not going to go over big with some of the locals. I mean, it's just too much cameras and everything going on. And, and like I said, I just, it turned into a turf war, which was too bad. Um, and just not necessary. So yeah, I think all, all of that kind of pushed me to say, you know what, I'm, I'm a big boy. I'm grown up. Let's yeah. just go home. I can still catch tarpon in Tampa and just be done with it. Right. Well, you know, this is very um, familiar to me, but we have people that listen to this podcast from all over the world. And and I'd like to just kind of go over like we like Boca Grande is this is this channel that there's tons of tarpon in. And then what are the jig fishermen doing? What is the jig? What are the live bait fishermen doing? And why was there this conflict to begin with uh, for somebody that's not familiar with the area? Um, can you can you kind of go through that of, of what caused this rift and, and why? Well, and and here, here's the puzzling part to me that I never could understand. Most of the live bait fishing, the big live bait boats that would get in there, most of them were inboards, big old wooden, beautiful Boca Grande. If you see mm-hmm. pictures of Boca Grande, you, you see these big old wooden boats with tarpon jumping behind them, beautiful boats. Um, 95% of the time, we weren't fishing them at the same time. It didn't, I don't think it had anything to do with water time. It had more to do with we were taking business from them. I always believe that the problem they had, the live baiters had, was they did it at night. What what is, for you, what's the most beautiful, epic part of tarpon fishing? Morning. It's the jump, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. It's visual. Yeah. We don't eat them, so we're not taking them home. It's all visual. Well, if you're fishing for them at night, where's the visual? You don't, you lose the visual. So the jig, when the guys got in there and figured out those fish would eat those jigs, and now everything's jumping, you're, you know, it's, you're getting pictures of everything. It's epic. Everyone can see it. You could see the fish rolling. So even if the fish weren't biting, everywhere you look, you've got rolling tarpon. You know, you're in the tarpon. So I mean, I, I don't, I'm not sure. Again, I, all I could figure was it was, that's why I call it a turf war because we didn't even bump heads all that often. The hill tides down there, your, your full and new moon outgoing tides are when the crabs would flush. Well, even at that time, we wouldn't jig fish. When the crabs would start to flush, we would dip crabs and drift through there with crabs on a spinning gear and and catch them just like they were catching. Um, Although they were using conventional gear with a weight straight down, we were using spinning gear and just kind of let those crabs get out, you know, back your boat into the tide and they would slurp your crabs and it would be game on. So, and I never really had any issues with them in there during that. I don't know if it got to be too many people. I, I don't really know what the deal was that the the crazy part about the jig and I could see how someone could think that you were originally it was a a four ounce jig and that jig and tail were zip tied to the bottom of like an a dot J hook. Hmm. So we're running 40 pound mono, 80 pound, hundred pound fluorocarbon leader to a a dot J hook. And then you would hang that, with a with a, a plastic tie that was actually designed to break away. The mm-hmm. reason they came up with it was so that when that fish ate that jig and it jumped, the violent head shake and all the power, it would break that jig away so that you didn't have a 150-pound tarpon jumping, throwing a four-ounce lead across Boca Grand Pass. Right. Because that's not gonna, that's gonna be bad. Um so I mean again, I you know, if I told you I, you've never snagged a tarpon, 
Yeah, I snagged a tarquin, but I've I've snagged a mullet working a school of mullet for a redfish before too. I mean, you know, he didn't eat my lure. I ended up getting him in the you know pet fin and and I snagged him. I mean, it it does happen, but ninety five percent of those fish you hook right in the butt, so they're eating the jig. Um, it was just a silly, just a silly battle to me, and it got pretty heated. I mean, there was a lot. I mean, the Coast Guard. There was there was a point where the Coast Guard and FWC officers were all over those tournaments because they thought something bad was going to happen. Um, you know, my wife telling me you're not going there and we're not going there and we're staying out of there and me wanting to go there because obviously those are my guys in the in the jig boats. So it was a crazy it was a crazy time, bro. Crazy time. So how now, there's still guys. How Still guys jig fishing. Yeah. How does it get resolved though? It, it doesn't seem well, to be as crazy. And is it maybe they, the well, beach, the beach project uh, changed things? I don't know. What, what changed? Well, there's still guys that jig fish. What they did was the FWC. And again, I think that was all kind of crazy. And that's for another podcast, but they made it. So the, the weight of the jig the, the the jig head couldn't be lower than the hook. Mm. So they changed the way we had to jig the pass is what they did. I don't, I mean, there's Dave Marquette. I mean, there's some legendary Boca Grand guys that are still jigging all day, every day and still catching a pile of fish. So I don't think it ever, I don't think it really did anything. Now it's got to be a non-intentional breakaway jig. So you have to, tie it up so that it doesn't, they don't want all that lead all over Boca Grand Pass. They used to do pass cleanups after the season. Once the sharks would get out of there, yeah. the divers would go. Yeah. <laughs> once the sharks are out of there, I don't know who's going to volunteer for the there cleanup was, during the season. Some, it was, it was an amazing, amazing thing. And one I wouldn't partake in, but guys would get in there and they would go down there and peel all that lead off the bottom and try and clean it up. So, I mean, that's really how it's, I don't, I don't know that it's been resolved. I'm sure the live baiters and the jig fishermen still don't like each other, but basically they saw it as a win. The pro tarpon tournament series went away. So that was a win for them. I'm sure. Um, you know, and again, I, I, I said the whole time it was going on. If somebody would just come to me from the side of the live baiters and go, you know what? We know you're not really snagging them. This is just a turf war. We don't like y'all here. You're a pain in our butt. We want you to go away. I'd be like, I can respect that. I totally get it. A hundred percent. Especially when we started with the 65 boats in the past. I I, I told my own team. I'm like, this is not going to last very long with us completely taking over Boca Grand Pass. Yeah. And it started where we were only one day. And then they went to a ladies day tournament on Saturday I'm like, this is not going to go over big. You just were, this is all about money. It's all about greed. And I believe once it starts to be just about the money, it goes south. And that's what happened. It went south. Yeah. Well, that was kind of entertaining to watch. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> there, was some, there was some incredible footage that came from, yeah. from those. It was a great time. So much fun. Tom. Tournaments. So much fun. But I could see, you know, I can see how, how people would not be down with that. You know, yeah. all, uh, yeah. you're taking a place that's, you know, basically old Florida at its core and there's a lot of tradition there there. And, and all of a sudden you're shaking it up and changing it in a way that the locals don't really like what, and, and, you know, if, if they did come to you and say that in a respectful manner, would you have left? Well, I don't, I don't know that I'd have left, but I think it would have, for me, it would have tempered a whole bunch of the, you know, I could have went to my guys and go, Hey, what they're saying is not wrong. Yeah. I could have went to all my boys and said, listen, you guys would be upset if you want, but what they're saying is spot on. What we're doing here is crazy. And again, I don't know why I saw it, but I literally went to the PTTS guys who were friends of mine because I was fishing for century boats at the time. It was a big sponsor there, Yamaha and century boats. I was on the century team and I'm like, dude, Make it a 25 boat tournament, charge three times as much money for the entry fee and make it like NASCAR, make it about the anglers 
Right now, you're making it about the fish, mm. which is great, except tarpon on, tarpon jump, tarpon gets eat by shark, tarpon on, tarpon jump, tarpon get eat by shark. It's just like NASCAR. NASCAR is so popular because people fall for the drivers. They fall for the story behind the scene. Yes, obviously, they like a crash, and they're going to like tarpon jumping. But if you make this about the personalities of the captains, the anglers, the top 25 jig fishing tarpon fishermen in the world, you can run with it forever. Sponsors will eat it up. You'll still make the exact same amount of money, and you can ease some of the noise. Because the noise is coming because we're taking over the past. That's not good. And and it it was, it was so much money so fast that it, it just never – they didn't want to hear that. So, yeah. and now it's gone, which is, you know, sad. Things change. Yeah. Yeah. Do you fish any other tournaments? You know, I did a lot of redfish tournaments. I, I fished the redfish tour for 10 years. Um, the tarpon tournaments, I still mess around with the redfish tournament every now and then, but same thing, just scheduling is tough. You know, you fish the tour mm -hmm. to, to compete on the redfish tournament trail, even today. Um, that the one part of that, that hasn't changed is you've got to pre-fish. <laughs> you've got to get in there and you've got to go. And it's, it's a lot of time away from home. It's a lot of time period. If you want to win. Yeah. You know, I did it. I did it for 10 years and I never won one. I had top fives, top tens, I had one year, I fished nine tournaments and I top 20 in every single tournament I fished. And I thought it was a phenomenal year, but I never did win a big one. I won it's hard some, to win. You know, it's it's real, hard well, to win. Really hard to win. Those guys that had great years like Brian and Greg Watts, uh, you know, Rick Murphy and Jeff Page and Rick and Guth, Murphy and Guthrie that had some of those runs where they won a couple in a season. You're like, wow, that's really hard to do against that field of talent. It's so really hard. hard. It's, it's really so hard. hard. That that is a very incredibly competitive deal. We we won Key Largo, and um, I was so relieved when we won that. I was like, man, <laughs> we just need to win one of these tournaments, like to be Redfish Tour champions. That would be so cool to have that, mm -hmm. like by your yes. name. And this is when we were yes. first getting our career started, and it was like. Yeah, we could say that. And then it's sure. like, well, we, we ought to be able to do that. We won plenty of tournaments in the Keys. We should be able to do that. Well, you know, we get second place in our first one, which was Titusville. We thought, well, this is going to be easy. Like, yeah. we're, we're, I mean, we're, we're just going to do what we do in the Keys. We're going to do it everywhere else. Boy, did we get our butts handed to us, man. We just got embarrassed when we went over to your area of that burnt store yeah. marina that was our worst finish ever we could not figure out what in the world to do it was still back then when when there were mullet boats and people were burning shorelines and stuff well that's where we were trying to fish we and to go fish somewhere else was we didn't know how to do that that was i mean and we weren't going to learn it in in the next 24 hours right so right. we got I think there were 65 boats in that. And I think we finished 65th in that tournament. And, and we were just like, Oh wow. Did we get killed? And then the next ones were up in Louisiana. And now you're trying to compete against the Anthony Randazzo's of the world that, that live and breathe and fish that all the time. Like it's their heartbeat, man. Uh, again, you know, we got, we got embarrassed and, and humbled to the point to where it's like uh, what we're doing in the keys may work in the keys and it may work in mosquito lagoon but we're gonna have to learn a whole new th type of fishing which actually was very exciting at the time it was also humbling and you know at times humiliating but it was very exciting because you know you may have one little thing dialed in pretty well but to think that that's the way it is and that you're going to be able to go and compete with these other people in their home water was was naive and and ridiculous because i mean those guys in louisiana then you go to texas and go up to georgia i mean everybody is great plus yes. you're taking all the best fishermen from texas and all the best fishermen from all over florida and they're going there too so you yes. got the home field advantage <laughs> and then you got the andrew bostics of the world that are just fantastic yes. fishermen and ridiculous. the watts brothers and the yes. you know rick murphy's and the on and on <laughs> 
And yeah. and it's like, okay, so you can catch some fish pretty well up in snake bite. That does not mean much in Texas. I mean, you it's might so be a fisherman. It's so funny that you say that. So when I went to the very first IFA in Jacksonville, I wasn't even a captain yet. I wasn't even guiding. <laughs> I was catching a few redfish around Tampa Bay and thought, man, buddy called me, was fishing for, uh, it was actually Billy. Billy Noble's my original partner on, on Real Animals years ago. And he said, hey, uh, he was sponsored by Ranger. They're having this tournament in Jacksonville. And I'm like, dude, I'm in. I got the entry fees. Let's roll. I'm in. I want to compete. I've always been competitive. I've always been an athlete. I'm like, let's, let's do this. We went to Jacksonville. Jacksonville and Tampa couldn't be any further apart. Same, I mean, same with the Keys. Jacksonville is a hard place to fish for me. Oh, huge well, tides. Huge tides. Cra- dirty they're, they're water. Eating, oh. They're eating these crabs that we don't have. We don't even have those kind of crabs. Like We don't know anything about this. I, we, I was so we were so lost when we got there. It was ridiculous. And to tell you the truth, the fact that you did well in Titusville early says a lot about your talent. You were fishing with Rich, mm-hmm, yeah, yeah. You guys are extremely talented because it took me about five years before I took a check in Titusville. Mm-hmm. There's no tide. Yes. How am I fishing in a place with no tide? I have tide. There's no moving water. It took me for. I used to call them on the radio shows. I used to call them the Vils. Yeah. I'm headed to one of the Vils. Go to Jacksonville and Titusville. I hated them both because it <laughs> took me forever. I mean, Charlotte Harbor, no problem. I can catch fish there. You want me to go to, you know, to the north up somewhere? No problem. West Coast, Florida, I got you. We're good. Fort Myers, we're good. I'll find them. We'll catch fish. We'll get we'll get in. We'll make it to the way. That coast over there boogered me all up. And then Louisiana is a whole nother that's a whole nother craziness. The way those fish eat and the amount of forage that's in that estuary is crazy. Yeah. What what I had a problem with uh, understanding and still do to this day. And every time I fish with my friend, Anthony, I, I'm asking him like, it's, I understand the tide and I, you know, I don't understand how it flows through here like you do because you're here all the time and this marsh is changing all the time, but I think I could get my arms around the tide. But then there's this salinity of the water that moves. There's a line that's moving back and forth. And I'm just trying to get my arms and my head around. How do you forecast this? Because I went to him one time and I said, I came back from pre-fishing. I said, man, I found the winning fish. I, I found them. And he said, oh, really? Where were they? And we were kind of working as a team there. Yeah. And so I, I had confidence that if I told him, he wasn't going to go there. And I said, well, they were in this little spot. He goes, nah, that's a good spot. They're not going to be there tomorrow. And I said, but there were so many there. And they were all perfect. They were perfect. Like these are 11-pound slots. And there were a lot of them there. And if I saw this in the Keys, they would be there for months like there's no way they're leaving. It would I'd just go back on the same tide and they would just keep coming back and then they would leave maybe. But like what happens to our spots a lot of times is if you have a big school of bonefish or a big school of permit or even a big school of tarpon or whatever you're fishing for, you'll the next day might be not as good, but there'll still be some. The next day after that, there's still some, but it's really dropped off from the day you found it. But there's still right. a couple. Like right. if you find something really good, it's going to trickle It'll trickle yeah. out and you can right. kind of go back there and you can kind of see, okay, one of these days I'm going to go back to the well one once too often and there's going to be nothing here, but you, right. you, it's not going to be any surprise because it's been this slow trickle out. Right. He was, he was just sure. He said, if you go back there tomorrow, they're not going to be there. <laughs> and I was like, there's just no way. So I go back there. They're not there. Yeah. They're not there. And I just was asking Anthony, like, how did you know that? And why? Because I went back on the exact same tide, and he's like, it's the salinity of the water. And and he has never been able to give me a real good kind of explanation of how you forecast that or how he forecasts that. It's almost more of a gut feeling, like based upon barometric pressure, rain, rain in, in north of of. Louisiana, yeah. like, is the sure. river going to pulse? Is, 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 has there been a lot of rain to the north? If so, how many days is the barometric right. pressure high? Is it low? Is it what's going on? And, and are the tides strong? Where, which way was the wind flowing? And he's just kind of like understands this, this natural, 
uh, pulsating wave of the salinity, which to me is that's a whole element that that we just don't deal with. We don't deal with that at all. And so, you know, I'm sitting here like in awe of him or you said, you know, you you guys are really talented fishermen to be in in um, Titusville and do well there. But really what it is, is it's just like you have a certain skill or whatever that transfers to a certain area. You had skills that transferred to Fort Myers or whatever. We were lost there because it's just I don't know. It's like, you know, what transfers and then. And then when you see somebody that's really good in all these areas, maybe they came from an area that like Andrew Bostick's a really good example of somebody that was, was maybe right at first, he wasn't the best in any area, but he was right there in all the areas and he would never fish far from the boat ramp. And he would just, he's just like, okay, well, this is, there's, there's gotta be plenty of fish right here and I'm just going to do what I do at home. But where, where he was at home, there was enough variety that he could fish for tailing fish. He could fish for structure fish. He could fish for fishing on jetties. He could fish, you know, he, he could fish for fish on the beach. He could fish. He, he had that where the keys actually pretty limited, um, for, for redfish like that. So we would have to basically, if we were going to use a transferable skill, it was going to be tailing fish or something that we could see. And in some of these areas, you couldn't see a a quarter of an inch into the water talk about being lost. (laughs) Here, here's the, here's what else happens on the tour, <clears throat> and it was a real, it was a hard thing for me to do. My uncle, uh, my uncle Bill Clutzbeaker, was four time world walleye fishing champion on the PWT up north. Wow! So when I first started to, you know, I started to point my nose in that direction, I called him, <clears throat> and I'm like, "Hey, what's the, what's the deal?" And uh, he said, I'll give you two pieces of advice, buddy. Two things you got to you gotta know. And I'm like, okay. And he said, one, whatever your game plan is, stick to it. Don't vary. If you say we're leaving here at 2 o'clock because I need to be there at 2.10, if you catch a fish at five minutes to two, don't change your plan. There's a reason you wanted to be there at 2.10. Go. Stay with your plan. You pre-fished it. You know what you want to do? Follow your plan. The other thing he said was, good luck finding a good partner, because that's the key. And when you said Andrew Bostic, you know, was the first thing I thought of? Hmm. Seppi. When Bostic and Seppi were together, that's when it gets really scary, because you had you had guys that had really strong skill sets in a couple of different types of red fishing. Mm-hmm. And then if they had the right partner that had the other skill sets yeah. that were good boy, it changed. I mean, that, that put those teams way ahead, way ahead because they had that extra book of knowledge on the boat already. Um, and I think that was the key guys who could, who were versatile enough to adapt to that new fishery and figure that thing out in short periods of time. They did really, really well. I do a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of stuff with the freshwater guys here because the central Florida Polk County is so big into the bass world. And they're the ones who really blow my mind. I just had a, uh, I just had a chance to uh, do a fishing conversation, a seminar that I put on here uh, locally with Bobby Lane who just won the Red Crest Cup and, you know, one of the best, one of the hundred best bass fishermen in the world. And I I do a lot of Q&A and and the group wasn't asking a lot of questions. I'm like, well, I got a question. How do you figure out how to catch bass? You grow up fishing Central Florida, West Central Florida at that. And then your first tournament of the year is in Minnesota. I mean, or Oklahoma or Texas or upstate New York, you know, you go from fishing where a cold day is 50 or 60 degrees. And now you're fishing where it's 25 and you still have to perform. You've got sponsor money involved here. This is how you chose to make a living to feed your family. There's, I just can't even imagine it. Those guys are so talented. It's 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 mind blowing to me. It really is. I mean, yeah. saltwater guys, as fishermen, we get a lot of love. It's all good, and 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 we're all really good at what we do. 
That little group, in my opinion, that group of the top bass anglers in the country, I think they're on a whole nother level. Yeah. I just do skill, skill wise. They're just in a world all their own. Certainly for, certainly for some things. I mean, we had the Sweetwater show and we did a lot of, of filming with, with Miles Berghoff and, and Joey Nania and different guests and stuff. And, you know, coming from the Redfish tournaments, I would always be like, look, why don't you guys go to these locations, you know, a few days early, really get it wired. And then we'll come in with the cameras. And, and they were always so against that. That was just not the way they did things because that the rule set doesn't allow for that. Right. Right. So it's not that they were trying to obey the rules while they were fishing for, for the show, but it right. was just kind of like they do better figuring it out on the go and on the time on the clock. Right. right. Like if it, we're going to give this 20 minutes here, and if this doesn't work, we're heading out to deep water or we're going to do this other thing or we're going to look for a thermocline or we're going to look for weeds or we're going to look for whatever. But they that was their comfort zone of going someplace and having never seen it before. Right. And it's it's like a developed skill, you know, where where for us, we would be like, oh, we're going to Texas. Well, let's leave two weeks early, you know, so right. we could try to figure the place out. And, you know, I guess there are ways that you could run a bass boat aground um but the navigation has to be a little bit easier than than what we were trying to do in the redfish sure. it's in louisiana yeah, or sure. texas or you know the keys for somebody that's never been there before i mean you can run aground real easy, um, real easy. but i i mean you, you, there's plenty of navigational issues with the bass fishermen but you're you're exactly right i mean there is there is a uh, uh, a skill set there that is incredibly respectable and yeah. um and then once they find the fish like that's that's what that game is all about like if you talk to Shaw Grigsby or somebody like that he's like it's not really about catching the fish it's about finding the fish consistently and being on them and then the the catching is the secondary thing but the secondary right. thing is super hard i mean you can look at <laughs> you can look at your 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 bottom machine and and you can you can see the same things that they're seeing but then you actually have to get that fish to bite and and that's that's hard but but it's they hard. do that all the time that's the that's the natural uh skill set that's been honed so much that it's like oh if we find them we'll catch them like right. they're not even worried yeah. necessarily right. about that, you know, but, <laughs> right. but I'm with you. They are incredibly skilled. I've had a uh, good, good opportunities to have a number of the, the bass fishermen on, on here. Odd uh, Defoe was on not too long ago. I mean, a guy that's had a great career, just, it's, yeah. it's, it's awesome though. Great yeah. And, and yeah. sometimes these people will do really well in areas that maybe you wouldn't think so like minnesota for a southern guy right. going up to minnesota yeah. and it's just like like what we're talking about though it's like some part of of their history and something that they're good at at home or somewhere has transferred there in some way shape right. or form maybe it's like yeah. it, it's different or it's it's a hybrid of what they were doing but at some point they got on something and they were like well i can do this and i'm going to stick on this and i'm going to i'm going to win yeah, yeah the, the, again, they're just, uh, I'm really close with Bobby Lane and Sean Grigsby, and I've had Sean on my boat before, and the skill set is just, and again, I, you know, I, I tell people all the time, I don't, I don't think I'm a great angler. I think I'm a very good angler. I mean, like you put me in a boat, I can catch fish. And if I'm on the boat with somebody who I think is a great angler, who is a great angler, I'm going to hold my own. I'm not going to embarrass myself, but I don't know that I'd call myself a great angler. Even here in Tampa Bay, we've got some guys that are just, they just, they think about stuff in a whole different way um, that separates them from the group. I mean, you, you understand it. I mean, you're guiding. There's guys who, you know, 90% of the fleet that day didn't catch anything. And two or three guys figured out what those fish were doing and caught them when nobody else did. And they tend to do that a lot. Well, it, they um, tend to do it all the time. And there, you know, yeah. there, there are, when I first started fishing the tournaments in the Keys, one of my favorite part about fishing the tournaments in the Keys was 
it was the red bone tournaments and they would, it was before digital scoreboards or anything like that. And they had a big scoreboard, big scoreboard and a ladder. And they used to go up there and everybody's name was on it and they go across and, you know, write in everything that everybody caught. And I would just sit there and study that board. I would just sit there and look at it. Like uh, I knew all these guys. Right. And, and there's some certain guys that at the dock, they always told you they caught fish. And, you know, they're always talking and stuff. And then there's this real quiet guy that never really says anything. And his name is always up there at the top, full points are full across the board. And a lot of the guys that talk all the time, boy, when it came to actually taking a picture of the fish, they had zeros across the board. Right. And right. then it just emerged after doing these tournaments a while that there were like six, seven people that were always there. They may not always win, but they're always there. Always. And and then there would be about 10 people that would alternate up in there. But right. but there's yeah. like and then there were like two or three people that were always at the top, always in the hunt. Always. Always. And and always. it's like what you, you know, I, it's it's like what you're saying. There's they they think about things differently. They're doing the homework. They are I I asked Tim Hoover, he was one of those guys. And Tim Hoover was somebody I really thought a lot of and and I would th I thought a lot of him because I would see him in a lot of my spots and then we fished a lot of the same spots and I would see him around all the time so I knew I was doing some things right but then when it came to the tournaments he was winning all the time and I was like what what are you doing man I'm, I see you in all these spots and I know I'm fishing the same spots and he knew I was there and he's like well I just pay attention to the details I, I make sure all my hooks are super sharp. That's, that's 1%. You know, that's a 1% advantage. I, I make sure that, you know, everything. He's like, I make sure my, my, my line's fresh. I make sure that the knots are tight. That's another 1% advantage. I make sure that this is this and this and this. And he just went through a few things and he goes right there. There's 10% advantage I got over, over everybody. He's like, do you do this? Do you make sure that, you know, whatever it was, uh, that your, that your angler has a, you know, can see, you know, is there, can, or can they be elevated? Can they see that's a 1% advantage. And he goes, when you add up all these 1% advantages and then you do them every single day, you could have a 15 to 20% advantage over the rest of the field. And you know what? I started thinking about it and I was like, okay, that's exactly right. So then it goes to something I talk about all the time of control the controllable. Where can you see something like a sharp hook or a good knot or fresh line or the best reels or or like the best rod and reel combination to deliver this and fight this fish? The 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 best net that's right, you know, what if if it says that it's a six foot net that's that's allowed, are you using a six foot net? Like, because right. if you're using a five and a half foot net, you're giving up six inches. Like where, where can you control the controllable and where can you, where can you be in, in control of what there is to control? Because there's so many things that are out of your control, the weather, yeah. the tides, the, the wind, the other anglers, what they do, even your I own think, angler, like, can, I, can I, you make a shot? I think that's. That's the advice I give to new guides. Okay. Brand new guides. I get it all the time. You probably get it too. You know, oh, my son, my, you know, my grandson, my son, he wants to be a fishing guy. Will you talk to me? Will you talk to me? He just got his cabin's license. When, I, when they ask me, you know, how can I be successful? Take care of the things you can control. Your boat, clean, live wells work. Cast nets are in good shape. Uh, all your line is spooled up. You're using good tackle. The, the the people that fish with us on a regular basis, they come from Ohio and Indiana. That guy's been grinding. He's been grinding for two years to take his family to Florida. They're going to sit on the beach one day, and he's going to get to go fishing. He's been watching the shows. He's been in the magazines. He's seeing it all. You can't make them eat. I don't care how good you are, even though you are Tom Rowland, you're <laughs> special. You can't make him eat. No, That's not a, it's not a controllable. Making sure he's got good tackle, making sure those hooks are sharp, making sure the boat's clean, making sure everything is right in your control will get those people to come back and fish with you again. 
That is, that's a key. Now, I think the great ones, we got a couple guys here. And, and, and one of the best in, in all of, in the whole Bay Area is Captain Jamie Goodwin. He's a phenomenal, he's been on my show several times. Good matter of fact, we lived together in Boca Grande. And I used to get irritated because Jamie would come in last after running. We'd all run a double. Jamie would be the last one in. And he'd be like, bird dog, how'd you do? And I'd be like, we got three. Oh, three. That's good. That's good. You got three. And then he wouldn't say anything. And I'd be like, mm. how'd you do, Jamie? Oh, we did okay. Jamie, how'd you do? Oh, we went 10 for 14. <laughs> I'm like, 10 for 14? Dude. And even when you talk to him, when you talk to him here in Tampa, and he's just snook and redfish and trout fish, and it's just a daily game, he will tell you, he doesn't need, don't, I don't need you to tell me where they are. If you tell me what your fish are doing, I can put that together somewhere else. Mm-hmm. I can take whatever they're doing on the water that day that you're seeing, and I can put that together and catch fish somewhere where you're not. Uh, it's It's amazing to me. He's one of those guys. I tell people all the time. He's the guy that's not happy that he knows where they are today. He wants to know where they are today, what they're eating, where they were yesterday, and where they're going to be tomorrow. (laughs) He's got to know it all. You can't just know that one little piece ain't good for Jake. He's got to know all of it. And that's why he's so good at what he does. It's that attention to detail. He controls the controllables. He He's just in the game all the time doing it the right way. And it's not easy to do in our environment, I don't think. The salt, the weather, the wind, you know, so many variables in what we do here. Um, the great ones just, they just stand out. They just do. And you're, by the way, your tournament resume, I was doing a little homework on you. <laughs> and I knew you were a great fisherman, but I got to see the tournament resume. It's quite impressive, my friend. The little red sh- redfish stuff you did, yeah, congratulations. That's a little fly on the wall to the rest of your resume there, um, Chief. Thank you. Really impressive, really impressive. Thank you. I enjoyed it. I, I had a good time with it, and, um, you know, then it became a, a a thing that much, much like your we, – we began this conversation um, of that's something that I loved and wanted to do, but then – it was not really compatible with the family. And a lot of people have asked, you know, like, well, you love the tournaments. Don't you just want to just go get in one? And I'm like, no, I don't see, I don't have any desire to fish in a tournament that I'm not going to put the time that it deserves into. And I don't have that time anymore. And I feel like that that deserves full time. Right. And, and if you have any, you, you just have to be naive and, and crazy to think that you're going to just be a part time tournament fisherman and you're going to go in there and win. You're not yeah, you going won't. to. It's there. There's really luck is not in it. Like if it was a one fish tournament where just the biggest fish won, yeah, there could be some luck that goes into that. But generally, if it's a couple of day tournament, there's not going to be any amount of luck that is going to make you compete with. Uh, you know, Andrew Bostic or Kevin Van Dam or Andrew or, or uh, uh, Anthony Randazzo or, you know, the greats, like they right. have taken luck out of the equation and they are doing things that are, are, are really hard to do. <laughs> they're really hard to do. And in a lot of ways, even at that level, some of the things that they're doing, the other people don't want to do like a Kevin Van Dam fish is so hard that other people they, they just can't keep up with him. I mean, it's, it's crazy. just, you know, he just has at a yeah. pace that is, is hard for anyone else to keep up with. And you got to really, really, really want to compete with him. And then a lot of people, I, you know, some of the professional bass fishermen I've talked to are just like, well, that's his game. I don't want to compete with him at his game. That's like, you know, there'd be other ways to beat him, but yeah. you're not, it's going to be really hard to beat him at his own game. Yeah. Right. Like, that, that could be hard. One of the best to ever do it. Yeah. 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 Hey, uh, before we finish up, how, what, what's your athletic background? Well, I was, uh, I was, uh, I played a lot of sports in high school. Um, I was probably a better basketball player than anything else. I was a top 100 uh, going into my, in five states, uh, going into my senior year. 
The bad part, the unfortunate part was I was about a bottom 100 student. <laughs> so I, I had the grades just good enough to, to play. Um, I had a bunch of letters and a bunch of interest coming out of high school. My dad wasn't going to pay for me to go to school and, and I wasn't strong enough to, to get a scholarship academically. So I went in the military. I spent uh, almost seven years in the Air Force. My first three and a half years were overseas, played basketball overseas, made the base team, traveled all over Europe. Um, it was it was a, a great, a great time. And it was something that I needed. The military for me was the right choice because I wasn't going to go to school. I wasn't going to do the, the book work needed to, to, to be there. I wasn't going to go to the NBA or anything crazy. So um, that all worked out good. The, the, the best part of it for me that I still, that still resonates so much is, is when I got to Germany, I was about 200 pounds and I could jump out of the gym. Um, but when I got there, I wasn't playing against 21 year old college kids. I was playing against 28 and 30 year old grown men who were not happy that I was out jumping them. So they were pushing me around pretty good. And that led me to the weight room. And, and that's been a part of, uh, of my life ever since. And, and having daughters, I, I think that's been a blessing. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So, and I still play, I play competitive slow pitch softball, which, even my wife doesn't understand at my age, but I really enjoy it. Um, it it's a lot of fun. So I'm still pretty active. I'm, uh, when we're done with the podcast here, it's actually leg day. So nice. I'm going to go get, go get a leg workout in. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm tempted on one of these trips to ICAST to fall into one of your little workouts. It has, I'm not sure. No, I'm not sure what, I can do it. What are you afraid sure of? What are you afraid well, of? I've, I've seen some of your videos. Well, I don't know what that's not how to. it's going to go down at ICAST. <laughs> I'm not going to try to kill somebody at ICAST. No, my, my thing is absolutely 100% scalable. I'll put it out here right now at ICAST. Every ICAST, I do these workouts in the mornings. And typically, we do a deck of cards, which is the reason why I do the deck of cards is because the easiest way to do the deck of cards is just do half the number, right? So if it's you turn over a 10 and it's push-ups, you do 10 push-ups. Okay, well, you can do one push-up, or you could do five push-ups, or you could just say, I'm tired, I don't want to do that card. Whatever, nobody cares, right? It's just a good camaraderie with a with a good group of people getting started in the morning, and then we turn over another card, it'd be, you know, four sit-ups. Okay, you can do one sit-up, you can do four sit-ups, you can do eight sit-ups, whatever you want to do. But then I'm we just wired. keep... We just keep I'm turning wired, the cards. I'm not wired like that. What, whatever the, the morning? card says, I'm, I'm going to have. It doesn't okay, matter. No, I can well. do the morning. Whatever the card says, I'm going to have to do it. It's just how I'm wired. Yeah. I'll well. be like, that's Tom Rowland. And Tom said I got to do 10 push Well, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot. You have to come. Okay. You, you got to come. It'll be uh, in the parking lot. Come at least one day. There's a great group of people. And, and it's, sure really, it it's really fun. And um, and we get a good workout in in the morning. And and um you'll you'll uh you can put it out to your your fans too and we'll have a whole bunch of people that'll show up i might do that we'll have to chat and see where you're staying and see if i can meet you this is the first year i'm going to stay i live pretty close yeah um so in the years past i've always drove back and forth um this year i've decided to stay so i'm, I'm pretty close to probably where you are so we'll have to i stay at the at the hilton together. there and the hilton and the rosen plaza are kind of connected but across yeah. the street from the hilton there is a fire station and then there is a parking garage next to the fire station. And I, I just meet in the parking lot of that fire station. And then there is another parking lot near there that's for some sort of a busing parking lot. Like a bunch of buses come in there and they have all these bus stops. And there are places that you can do pull-ups and, and you, can run around the, you can run around the parking lot. It's just a great place to meet. And uh, it's that fire station that's that's where that's where we've done okay. it the last few years and and it's uh it's been great but yeah i'd love to have you that'd be fun i always see all, i see all your social media on it i'm 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 really i'm i'm impressed with with the the fitness side of of tom Rowland. i actually i'm a little bit if i'm being honest and and i'm i'm absolutely honored to be on your podcast i really i don't listen to a lot of podcasts um, but I have found myself listening to yours. I think you do a great job at this. Thanks. Um, and I just think you're an interesting cat with the fishing and the fitness. And, you know, I think you do a little hunting too. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm like, this is uh 
this is a cat to uh, him and I have a lot of stuff in common. Yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah no, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we, we definitely do. I mean, I don't know about, about you, but I mean, the, the fitness angle for me, um, cause some people don't, don't really understand where that comes from and, and why that's so important to me. But you know, when, when, when I was a guide early in the keys, when I first went down there, I couldn't spend three days on the boat. I mean, I would go down there coming from Montana and Idaho and Wyoming and, and, and going down there, the sun was so strong and I didn't know how to take care of myself. I wasn't drinking enough water, wasn't wearing the right clothes. And the people I'm with, we could, they could go for days and days and days. They could go for two weeks, but even they would get tired. And then it was like, you know, they would just, they, we would just have to take a day off. Well, so I was like, man, I got to do something to get in better shape. Well, part of the, part of it is just conditioning of the heat and can, and acclimation of, of, you know, being in the heat and the salt water and, and, and staying out there on long days and, and balance and, and just being more comfortable on the boat. But eventually, you know, once I started guiding, it's like, okay, uh, I can go for seven days. Okay. Well, then I got married and I wanted to, you know, now it's time to make a career out of this and seven days in a row and then having to take three days off that didn't, that wasn't flying because right. so, so I started paying more and more attention to my physical condition and my physical health hydration, um, staying, you know, covering up as much as possible. Then I started running, then I started lifting weights. Then I started, um, you know, uh, doing all different kinds of things. And the, every little thing that I did would be another day that I could go. And then one, one year I was doing 175 days in a row. That was my record, no days off. And you know what that meant is that I could support my family that I could, you know, it's, it's it's very expensive in the keys, very much like living in Boca Grand, right? Like there's not going to be a cheap place to live. So being in the keys, it's very, very expensive and you just don't have time to, to take days off. And so I just wouldn't plan any days off anymore, but that came with being physically prepared to do that. And for, for many years, I wasn't physically prepared to do that. And so I would say, okay, well, I'm going to fish seven days and then I'm going to take two days off. And then I'll fish seven days and take two days off. And I would plan that in the calendar. But I was only planning that because I felt like I'm going to be really tired. And then, you know, when you have kids, you know, and you got a wife and kids waiting for you to, I mean, that was our only means of support. Like sure. fishing paid for everything. And so right. it's like, well, I'm just booking every day. And I heard Tom Pierce say that one time. He was like, I just book every day and then weather will, weather will sort it out. But then, sure. you know, even when it's really rough, your people are there like, we'll go. Yeah. Okay, let's go. I mean, yeah. if it's not borderline, you know, hurricane, you know, yeah. then, then then we're going. But the only way I was able to do that was was to to really pay attention to the physical fitness. And then then the physical fitness becomes like – not a drudgery, but something that you really enjoy. And then it becomes part of your life. And then you can't imagine doing, being without it. And then, then I feel like it's like a, and that's kind of one of my gifts to give to other people that don't well, know, don't know how to do it. Like, I mean, you know, I was an I'm athlete still, like you. I'm still guiding. So, and I, I hear it from the guys all the time and I'm, 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 I just turned 54 years old and, and the guys are like, you know, dude, and I, and I don't guide like I used to guide because I have stuff I got to do. And, um, you know, my schedule, I'm probably guiding still three days a week, sometimes four, sometimes five. If it just, I've got trips I have to run with people that I've been fishing for years, whatever. But normally I fish three days a week. But even then, in the middle of summer, when, when we're all standing around after the morning trip and everybody's hot and tired and they're like, you know, I'm like, dude, it's leg day. And they're like, you're going to the gym? I'm like, it's leg day, going to the gym, not skipping leg day. And I think that's really helped me get through the guide business isn't easy on the body. It's just no, it's not. not. So, and I believe that me being a gym rat has helped me get through it all. It really has. It saved my body. The reason I can still play ball and do some of the stuff I can do. My youngest daughter was a college basketball player and being able to run around with her a little bit and still get on the court and 
not look like a fool. I think that's all because of the active job that I have. And then mixing that with my love for being in the gym. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think it becomes a drug. I think it's, uh, I've had doctors tell me, you know, injure this and injure that and you're out for six weeks and you're grouchy and you're miserable. And the doctor would be like, dude, you, when you train the endorphins that are released in your body become part of who you are when you train as much as you and I do. Yes. Um, I think you're on another level. I think you're on a little, you and that CrossFit thing you have going on. I'm not sure I understand all of that, but I dig it. I respect you for it. Um, but it's a whole nother level. Um, but I think that's all, it just, you know, it becomes a part of who we are. Um, yeah. and, I, and I think it's, it's a good thing for sure. And, and, um, I, I, I truly enjoy it. And, and it yeah, took a too. while, right? Like it wasn't, you know, when I first started running, um, after, after a layoff, I mean, you know, I was a wrestler in high school. We ran all the time. Right. But I never thought I'm going to do a marathon. Right. And so it was when I, when I, you know, took time away from, any kind of working out because I found fishing and now it's like, okay, all I'm doing is fishing and I'll get enough exercise just walking up and down the river and we'll hike into wherever we're going or, you know, whatever, but that's not the case. You know, you, you don't. No. Right. And then no. you're also not paying attention to your diet or anything else. And so there were several years there where I, all I was doing, I mean, all I was doing was fishing. And then it becomes obvious because of the salt water that, that man, I got to be in better shape to do this right like this is not i can't make it like i can't do what the minimum that's required and so that my first thing was i mean i was a wrestler in high school so it's like what am i going to do go wrestle like i really didn't know what to do and then i thought well i can go join a, a gym i guess and i think gyms are super weird uh personally i don't i mean that's why i have my own setup you know because <laughs> you, the gyms are gyms are it depends on which gym you go to right but but some gyms are super weird and so i was like okay well i'll just do my own thing and then i i said well i'll just i'll just start running and it was just misery at first and i just remember like just like okay well i'm just gonna run for 30 minutes Right. Like I, I'm not even going to pay attention to how fast I'm going or, or, or how far I'm going. I'm just going to run for 30 minutes. And most of that, some of that could be even be walking. And then that developed into, wow, I'm finally, this has got, you know, it's not drudgery. It's not, not painful anymore. And then I decided I was going to run a, a marathon and that was awesome. I loved that. And that really, you know, the process of running a marathon is very, very similar to what we're talking about with the process of, of entering fishing tournaments and winning fishing tournaments. And there's so much preparation that goes into it and so much building a plan, sticking to that plan. And, and, you know, in, on occasions you have to alter the plan, but for the most part, you get the plan, you stick to it. And, and it, and the end result is that you can accomplish this goal that you you had and there's lots of little details along the way and that really started my my love for for training was the was the marathon training really uh, the running and i don't do as much of it now as i as i used to but um that's that's a good time man and and it teaches you a lot about yourself and a lot about um i don't know just it just teaches you a lot about life a lot about yourself the marathon thing is good for me because there were a lot of there's a lot of time to think you know, you're out there and it's kind of like moving meditation. You, yeah. I would go away, I, w- I would leave the house and you're thinking, uh, you know, how am I going to pay these bills? How am I going to, you know, uh, get more fishing trips? How am I going to deal with whatever situation it is? You go run for an hour, you come back and you're kind of like, it's good. I know what I'm going to do now. Right. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Yeah. I, and the gym can I, do that. It's, it's for me. Um, and I'm not a big talker in the gym. I don't, I don't need, I don't need people chatting with me, put my, put my tunes on and just go to work. And it's, I call it, it's as much a workout and a relaxation for my brain as it is anything else. Yeah. Just a little bit of, I call it Mikey time. It's a little bit of Mikey time. I've been married to the same great woman now for almost 26 years. And if something happens, I miss three or four days. She'll like, look at me in the living room and go, go 
go to the gym. I, I don't, don't, don't touch anything. Get in your truck, go to the gym. Do not come back until you get a workout in. You're a mess. Right. Go. I, and that's, I think that's all true. I think, it, especially I've been, you know, I've been lifting and in the gym probably three days a week minimum for 35 years. Yeah. Becomes a part of who you are. For I sure. Mean, it, it just does. Um, the only place I'm probably happier than in, in, in that world is in a, I, I love to be in a basketball gym, an old gym with a wooden floor with a basketball beating off a wooden. I don't know what that is. I grew up in a small town in Wisconsin and a lot of those gyms were just little band boxes yeah. with wooden floors. and Like the movie just, Hoosiers. Yes, I, I, it exactly. was it was painted so well in that movie yes. Hoosiers. Yes. That, I don't even Perfect. really like basketball, but I love that movie. I mean, it, that's how I that's how I grew up in gyms just like that all over central Wisconsin, and so that's kind of a happy place for me. And I don't have to even be playing anymore; I can just be coaching or watching kids play, and yeah. I'm I'm in a I'm in a happy place, you know. But um, yeah, it's it's unique. It's interesting how that becomes a part of who we are. Isn't it funny? Like Pretty when cool. you when you've been away from that like you just mentioned the 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 ball bouncing on the on the wood floor and the way that sounds and the way it feels and it's the same like for for wrestling with with me i was away from wrestling for a while and then my kids started wrestling and i helped start the the wrestling club in key west and i was running by this gym and i hear these sounds I'm like what is that why is that so familiar and i'd run all the way around this gym and i finally found a door that was kind of open and that's where the noise was coming from and i was like oh that's a wrestling gym no wonder like it sounded so familiar and you step in there and it's like you put on this old leather jacket or <laughs> your your favorite pair of blue jeans or something and you're like oh this is like so comfortable Comfort. like Comfort, this is yeah. so comfortable where is this how did i let this escape my life like it's been yeah. gone for like 10 years now and now it's yeah. like now i'm back in this place and yeah. and all these familiar sounds and all these familiar smells even though they they smell terrible right. <laughs> it, smells, it smells like a bunch of bunch of kids that have bo right but right. but it's like that's where i grew up like that's yeah. it's just kind of funny yeah. how that it just comes back to you like that just, um, i hear it i can hear it when you say that when you said Jim and you heard a noise, I heard the squeak of tennis shoes. Sure. Squeaking on a wooden floor because that's what you hear in a basketball gym. Starting and stopping, squeaky tennis shoes on the floor, the basketball bouncing. It's just one of those it's one of those things you'll never forget. You fall in love with it as a kid and it stays with you forever. That's right. Um yeah. All right, man. Well, this is this has been great. You, we didn't even get to your show. Where? How do people watch your show? <laughs> uh, well, we are on uh, Sportsman's. We are on World Fishing Network. We're on Valley Sun Sports. We're on Waypoint TV. Nice. Um, having having great results with Waypoint TV. Uh, enjoying that digital platform and everybody's opportunity to just watch it for free uh, whenever it suits them. Seems to be working out really, really good for us. Uh, I do a local station here because that's where the show started on a local station here in Tampa, local broadcast station, which uh, does really well for us. So, yeah, I, I don't even 21 years of radio, 16 season of Real Animals TV. I, I don't I don't know how I could get any more blessed. I really don't. I just and, and to be in a group of guys like you and Rich, um, like Blair like Rick, CA, um, you know, Rob Fordyce, uh, George Gods. I, you know, when I sit back and I think about the group of shows that comes out of Florida, the national shows that have been around a while, that people recognize the hosts, it, it's, it's mind blowing to me. It really is. Mm. Cause I have so much respect for that group. Sure. You know, a lot of us have become friends. You and I haven't spent a whole lot of time together. Um, but, you know, uh, Carter Andrews, yeah. I mean, just these phenomenal anglers, these phenomenal personalities, these phenomenal people that I just feel blessed to have these, you know, friendships with. It just seems really awesome to me. So, and I love doing what I do. You know, if if you, and, and you know the feeling when you're you're out somewhere and somebody just, you know, says, hey, I really love the show. You know, I don't need you to 
stop me and have a five, 10 minute conversation, but just to, Hey, love what you do, keep it up. And you, you get the feeling that you're adding something, you're taking your adventures and you're delivering that to these people. Mm -hmm. Um, To me, it's just an awesome feeling. I absolutely love it. And there was no, I don't know about you, but for me, there was no, I didn't preconceive it. I mean, I was from, I'm a kid from Wisconsin. I was a basketball player from Wisconsin. I had no idea when I got stationed in Tampa here that I would live here the rest of my life. I would marry a Tampa girl and become a saltwater fishing guide and end up with radio shows and a TV show. And that wasn't the plan. It just kind of all fell. So it's just, it's really weird and, and humbling and, and awesome. And I, I am, like I said, I'm truly honored to be, I'm, I'm on the Tom Rowland podcast. It's crazy. <laughs> well, it's crazy. I'm honored to have you, man. Congratulations on all your success. It's been, it's, uh, it's, it's cool to watch um, from the outside and, and you're doing, Thank you're you. doing really great things. I appreciate you, brother. I, like I said, I, I've got a good group of guys around, some some guys that I look up to to, to, try to try to keep that train going the right direction. But you're certainly one of those people. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. And I appreciate you coming on. Um, so they can watch your show. How do they listen to your radio show? Uh, we're on the iHeart radio app. You can just, you know, you put the iHeart app on your phone and you can check out the show, Real Animals. So we're on Saturdays and Sundays, two different stations, but they're both iHeart stations. Uh, both Saturday, uh, Saturday morning shows, Saturday morning and Sunday morning. So my weekend mornings are a little bit shot, but uh, they're live call-in shows. And, and what I love about that is, that, again, it gives us an opportunity to give back, gives us an opportunity to teach people a little bit and, and help them understand You know, not just the how to's and the when to's and the where to's, but the politics of fishing. That's a huge part of everything we have going on with fish closures and, um, you know, water quality issues, you know, things like that. We've had CCA Florida is a big part of everything I do. Captains for Clean Water, big part of of what I believe in, uh, the great work that they're doing. So it's it gives us a great platform to deliver that information to a, a, a pretty significant amount of people. Nice. Nice. That's awesome, man. Yes. Good yeah. job. All right. Well, I hope to see you at ICAST. I'll see you at the workout. You'll see. Uh, you might. <laughs> you make sure, make sure. What time's the workout? Uh, What's the, what time I don't know. It in? depends on like what time all the things start in the morning. Uh, probably like 530. 530. 530. You know? Well, I mean, I think there's a waypoint breakfast at 7 or 730. So, you know, you got to get it in and be done with it before, before. What's the waypoint breakfast? Six. I don't, I don't, I don't know. know about it's the waypoint. It's just being, you, you will, it'll, it's just okay. being put together today. Um, oh, okay. But uh, you, you will know about it. I promise that. Uh, All right. If, I'll be there. If it actually happens, you'll definitely know about it. But we were, we were, <laughs> we were planning it today. Uh, oh, good. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Uh, cool. But there's a lot of things, you know, and at seven or seven 30, I think, you know, we have a couple of breakfasts in the morning, but yeah, six, five 30 or six. I don't know. I'll let you know. I'll send you a message. All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to get loose early <laughs> in the morning. I've been training in the afternoon for a while, so 5.30 ought to be interesting. But I believe that would be a great thing. I think that's a great thing to do to attack that. ICAST is, a, is an important part of what we do. Yeah. So early morning workout might do me some good. All right. Cool, man. All right. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. Great to get to know you a little bit better and uh, hear your story. Thanks for having me, brother. Okay, I appreciate man. you. Thank you. All right. See you.